What I'm telling you are things are proven. I'm not the test run. I've already done the test run for many years. And I can tell you stories. Stories of a village we went to preach. And the witch doctor of the village accepted Jesus. We led him to Christ. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. And he became, his spiritual growth was faster than the growth of the normal people. We brought him into ministry and sent him back to the same village that he was their chief doctor. Here, welcome to Reminant TV. On Reminant TV, you'll be getting powerful messages that will change, transform your life for good. Please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Very radical. Okay. Are you there in verse 23 of Genesis chapter 2? And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The, my second point is from verse 24 which says, Therefore, because you have this knowledge, that you have found the bone of your bone are you there because you have this knowledge from the witness of the holy ghost that you have found the flesh of your flesh then therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and there shall be one flesh stop there um for married women in this room i don't know how marriage is done in India I don't know how marriage is done in Europe I don't yet know how marriage is conducted in the United States of America so the example I'm going to give is an African example if you are not offended with that right so in a typical African marriage a suitor goes to ask for the hand of a lady from her parents or her guardians They will give him a long, a long list of things to provide which he will provide and then give him a prescription of what is called a bright price which he will pay the moment the parents or the, the guidance accept the bright price they will release something like prayer and bless their child and release the child so within the context of the african tradition marriage has been accomplished are you with me but we are not africans we are christians so when you finish that one then you now come to church so that god can can bless it okay so so don't don't think i'm prescribing an african method don't when the marriage is contracted the lady no longer bears the name of her family even though her family can be a powerful one, she takes on the name of her husband. So in marriage, in the practical sense of it, in marriage, it's a woman that leaves her family to join the husband's family. Is that not so? Yes, but this is what the scripture says. The scripture says, therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother? The scripture did not say a woman. So what is the meaning of this scripture? Are you following me? Those of you that are, those of you that are not Africans, I hope my, my explanation is, you understand what I'm trying to say. Because if I had known your culture and how you get married in your culture, I would have used your, your culture. But I don't know. But I, I think I will need to know. After this service, I will engage you and find out a little bit about your culture. So in the African culture, the woman leaves and becomes a member of the family of the man. She takes their name and she becomes part of them. They would decide if, if they will allow her to visit her parents because she has shifted completely. But the Bible says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. What's the meaning of that scripture? How many of you have attended a typical wedding ceremony? Somewhere in the wedding ceremony, they will ask the parents of the bride to come and sign a register have you seen that before that's what happens when somebody is leaving power you sign out of power and then the new guys coming into power sign into power so what that scripture is saying is that the man leaves the government of his father and mother the, his own father and mother from the government so he's being released from the government of his father and his mother that's why they sign out 
so that him and his wife forms a new government. That means after that signature is appended, it is now illegal for the man's parents to dictate what happens in the woman's, in, the, in, in his house, because they've signed out. He's no longer subject to the authority. You get that? The next thing, after you have that connection, bone of my bone, you know that you are supposed to, you have a part in this company. The next thing is that you need to sign out from every other authority that holds you spiritually. And then sign in to the new company, the authority that is established within the new company that you have found yourself. I'm teaching you how to belong to a church. You sign out so that you can do what? Sign in. Spiritually, you cannot be under two companies. Because you are going to disqualify yourself from spiritual inheritance. In the next one year in this house, some of the dimensions of grace operational in my life will begin to operate in people's lives. No, that's not a prayer. It's going to happen. No, it's an entitlement. You aren't, oh my. <laughs> it's an entitlement. It's not a prayer. It's not that this is what I desire. No, it's going to happen. The reason is because in a family, there's something called inheritance. You become eligible for spiritual inheritance because you are a bona fide member of that family. But if you have loyalties in terms of two, you will be disqualified and disinherited from your inheritance. You are not eligible. It's just like somebody that they are, we are not sure of your, of your paternity. The DNA is showing that you are from Congo. That person is not going to receive any help. <laughs> There's a challenge. The DNA test has already put you on the edge. So you will need to leave previous governments and come under the authority of the government of your destined company. Are you see that? Now let me show you something because a critical factor that must be evident in church life is called authority. This is in module two. There are seven things that must be in a bona fide church architecture. And I'm gonna show you seven other things that you will find in a satanic organization that is masquerading as a church. There are seven things you will find there. And a true church, there are seven things that you will find there. Those are in subsequent modules, we're gonna build it. And if by any means you find yourself and join yourself to a satanic organization masquerading as a church, the inheritance you will receive is demonic inheritance. Not because you are praying for it. Your connection to that house entitles you to a portion of inheritance. You know what you are dealing with? <laughs> you are not with me. Are you, are you here? Now, you see what we are dealing with here is spiritual. And whether you know it or not, it is valid. That's the thing about spiritual things. The thing about, in natural, in natural realm, you cannot operate as a doctor because you don't have the knowledge. Even if you desire to conduct an operation, <laughs> you don't have the knowledge to do it. But in spiritual things, you can be ignorant and the thing is still effective on your life. And that's why one of the great duties that we in, in the ministry um, quadrant have to, all of you in this congregation, is to feed you with truth so that your eyes will be enlightened. So you are operating with spiritual knowledge. You are sure of the results you will get when you operate in accuracy. The days of ignorance are over. It is our duty to make spiritual things commonplace. Commonplace. Demystify spiritual things and present them as utensils of enhancement for life and for destiny. That's my duty. Are you still with me? All right, so I'm going to show you the difference so that when you see some symptoms you know that okay you are in the house of satan i'm going to show you that therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall be one flesh now you will notice are you still with me i just want to i want, I want to digress i want to digress Notice that when a man joins, is joined to his wife, they twine will become one flesh. You get that? Okay. So do you still notice that when the Bible says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Are you there? It's one spirit with him. So marriage in the natural 
is supposed to be an illustration of our marriage in the supernatural. So marriage did not begin here. It's a spiritual thing. And that's what is obtainable with you mystically with Christ right now. You are one spirit with Christ. The thing about your connection with Christ is that it is spiritual. Right now your spirit is mingled with the spirit of Christ. And the reason why that is so is because the description of the Christian life, according to Apostle Paul, is that he's supposed to live out Christ. It means Christ in him will register his impressions. Are you there? Christ in him would register his preferences. Enough for him to discern it. Christ in him will register his will. He is supposed to align with the impressions of Christ in his vessel and leave it out. That is Christianity. Your true personality as a Christian, according to doctrine, is Christ in you. When you begin to live that way from the promptings of Christ, you are beginning to conform to the image of Christ. Because you are one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. But in marriage, you become one flesh with your husband. Okay, when we go into marriage, I'm going to break the mystery down. There are 14 things there. We're going to break it down. Then you see the 14 things. Once you can see these 14 things, you will discover that those 14 things have their reference in our spiritual marriage, the spiritual union. And those 14 things are supposed to be in your earthly marriage. Those 14 things are supposed to be in your church family. If it is missing, it means that what is manifesting is not a prototype that is obtainable in the mystical union. Did you get it? In a church family, we become one. One mind. One passion. And the mind we have is that we have a king. Our king is the Lord. The passion we have is that we were born to serve his will. We have one mind. We have one passion. You did. So everything we do, the way we deploy finances, the way we, the things we do, is a realization of our service to God. He has revealed to us that this is what he wants. And it's on the strength of what he reveals that we are deployed to achieve. So we are not operating according to the prescriptions that come from our preferences, but the prescriptions that come from his heart. That is how we become his people. So if he has concerns, he will come to us and share his mind. If he has, he's troubled, he will come to us and speak about his trouble. And that's why in, in, when I finish my teaching now, we'll begin to pray. When we begin to pray, we're giving him the opportunity to speak to us. Because the reason why we are set up is that we are an administration that is designed to carry out his preferences. Are you there? So his glory will sit over us. And if there's anything that is in your life that is contesting, wants to be revealed through your life, maybe a spirit of reproach, when his glory rests upon you, the spirit of reproach that for, for any reason has access to your life will lose his grip over your life because... By an act of your will, you have decided that you want to serve him. So that spirit will lose ground because your will does not support the, the presence of that spirit around your life. Amen. Verse 25 now says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So in a church family, you can be vulnerable. Are you there? For those of us in the frontline ministry, the people will come and open their lives to you. That's the way of the family. And when someone, their covenant as a minister of the gospel is that anything that is shared with you, it goes to the grave of your soul. Yeah. It will never be discussed. It will never be heard so that people can be naked and not be ashamed of their nakedness. That's how the wounds of the soul are healed. That's how bruises that pierce the, within the souls of men are recovered. Because they were naked. 
and they were not ashamed. A time will come where you will need to talk to somebody. I know you have everything going. You are a strong guy. Strong. You will need to talk to somebody. So the family creates an opportunity for you to be vulnerable. If you are always strong, you are in trouble. Because a day will come where a situation that is orchestrated from the spirit will haunt you. Your strength will fall like a pack of cards. And that's why when they left the place of persecution, they did not go to the post office to look for their mails. They went straight to their company. They were both naked. And they were not ashamed. So in this environment, we find a healthy environment where destiny can be incubated. And what God has in mind is clear. I need to show you the kind of things to expect when you are properly aligned in such a place. I will end with telling you the kind of things that God does in that arrangement. Isaiah chapter 61. Are you there? There are two twin scriptures. There are prophetic scriptures in the book of Isaiah. The first one is Isaiah chapter 60. I'm going to teach on that very soon. I hope you'll be there. It's on the move of the word of God. Isaiah chapter 60 is about the move of God's word. The move of God's word. God's word travels with government. It travels with authority. And God's word has the capacity to say, to do, to accomplish what it is saying. It is through God's word that God created. So God's creation has not finished. He wants to create some things in your life and he's going to use the instrumentality of his word. In Isaiah chapter 60, we see a calibration of the stage by stage implementation of the policies that are carried by the word of God. That's why we call it the prophecy of the move of God's word. God's word as I'm trying to bring you to understand, is not the written word. God's word is the spoken word. When you hear that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, it's not saying hearing by the Bible. It's hearing by the voice of God. Is that clear? The Bible is a compendium of God's thoughts. And a man that knows the voice of the Bible will be able to recognize the voice of God. Are you with me? Oh, you're not with me. <laughs> you're not here. You're not here. So let me, let me leave you. <laughs> are, you are you there? Yeah. I don't know in what language you think, but maybe you think in English. Are you, are you there? I'm trying to explain. Do you th I think in English. I don't know the language in which you think. But that language in which you think is like the logos, the letters. So that's the language of God's thoughts. Do you, do you get it? So if you think in English, if I speak in English, you'll be able to recognize what I'm saying. You know the meaning of what I'm saying because you think in English. English is not talking. English is just a language. I am now talking because you understand English, you can understand what I'm saying. Okay. So the Bible is a compendium of God's thoughts. That's how God thinks. If you know how God thinks, you'll be able to identify how God speaks. Oh, you're not, you're not still with me. Be patient. There are loads of things you'll be taught. Not just for teaching's sake. It will make you understand so that you can practice Christianity. The proof that you understand is in the practice. If I teach you about how to hear God, and you cannot hear God, it means I'm a bad teacher. So the reason for the teaching is to bring you education so that you can understand how to practice it. It is the doer that is blessed. Okay. Yes, but you cannot, you cannot practice if you do not understand. So teaching, Bible teaching is not for information purposes. It's for understanding purposes. And it's only those that are equipped and armed with understanding that can practice. Okay. okay. So the move of, of, of the word is what you find in the book of Isaiah chapter 60. By the time we go to Isaiah chapter 60 and we do the teaching, you will now know how to receive the word of the Lord for your life. You want to do business, how do you know which one to do? You must receive the voice of God. 
So what we have in the book of Isaiah chapter 60 is a description of the experience that you have when the voice of the Lord enters your spirit man. Okay? I'm going to describe it. So that's Isaiah 60. In Isaiah chapter 61, that's what we call the move of the spirit. Because the words of God are infused with the spirit of God, that's what makes them living. That's what makes them active. That's what makes them alive. So Isaiah chapter 61 now tells us about the move of the spirit. Because one guarantee we have is that if our gathering is in his name, his presence will be animated by his spirit. You there? All right. Let me go back and read this to you. Isaiah chapter 61. This is the kind of thing that God does when he has a true apostolic company. This is his obligation. This is his determination. This is his covenant. If we are all always operating by his spirit, always seeking to fulfill his will, then this covenant is, is, is in view for us. He said, the spirit of God is upon me because the Lord had anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim an acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all their debt more. When I will do a conference, the move of his spirit, so I don't want to start going into these matters before that conference. However, this is what happens to us when we are under the cloud of his glory in a local church expression. He said there's an appointment to them that more. See, when you are under the cloud of his glory in the local expression of the body of Christ, every morning person has an appointment with God. He said to appoint where are we? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. So the first line of appointment is that he will give beauty for ashes. Yeah. Ashes represent waste. Maybe there's, you, you say you've wasted 20 years, you've wasted 25 years. Calm down. Calm down. There is an appointment that God has in his house that is designed to deal with that type of money. Ashes are wasted. Ashes are products of waste. But out of ashes, and if you are a chemist and you understand what a chemical reaction is, a chemical reaction is irreversible. That's the kind of reaction that took place for which ashes are formed. But the Bible says, for ashes, he will produce beauty. So your ashes, your waste, becomes the raw material with which God will now create beauty. This is, this is the kind of thing that happens when the move of the Spirit. We have access to a powerful measure of the Holy Ghost because of the alignment of the local expression of the body of Christ that we are part of. Then your beauty begins to, your ashes begin to transform to beauty. So it doesn't matter where you came from and the things you encountered and the things that encountered you. The plan is this. There is an appointment for the morning ones in Zion. God will give to them beauty for ashes. He will give the oil of joy for morning. So instead of morning, he gives an, an anointing. And just in case you'll be mourning, opportunities lost, you were so close to so getting the house, the mortgage was up to get date, and from the time COVID happened, you were paralyzed, you lost the mortgage, you lost the house, you lost the car. The people that come for a position, those people with muscles that, are, that talk bad, you encountered them. They repossessed your car, repossessed your house. The credit cards you used is now a curse. He said there's an oil. It's called an oil of joy. And I tell you, this is not the work of a preacher. This is the work of the Holy Spirit when he's moving. Not a preacher. Don't come to me and say, you spoke about a, an oil. Hey, this is the move of the Spirit. <laughs> when the Spirit of God is moving, 
He does a work of recreation in your life. And in place of mourning, he gives you an oil of joy. He gives you a garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. And you have carried depression and heaviness. You, you, you feel cheated for so many years of hard work. Ah, that's raw material. A garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness he will give. Because there's an identity he wants to make out of you. So that you can be called the trees of righteousness, the plantings of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So God wants to derive glory from the beauty that he's going to build into your life. But that beauty is built within the context of the authority he establishes within the local expression of the body of Christ. Then he begins, that oil begins to work on you gradually. Gradually. The recovery continues gradually. If you can endure the process, then the promise is sure for you. Gradually. Gradually. The oil of joy for money. Gradually. The garment of praise for the spirit of evidence. That they might be called the trees of righteousness, the plantings of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Everyone that is privileged to have the opportunity to survive under an atmosphere that the Spirit of God is manifest because the Lordship of the Spirit of God is established over the room. You begin, I have been a minister of the gospel from when I was a teenager and I started pastoring when I was. How old was I? I was unmarried. I was single. I was a young guy. And I was just teaching the word of God. And I saw how that word transformed people. I have first-hand experience in this matter. What I'm telling you are things are proven. I'm not, the test run. I've already done the test run. For many years. And I can tell you stories. Stories of a village we went to preach. And the witch doctor of the village accepted Jesus. We led him to Christ. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. And he became, his spiritual growth was faster than the growth of the normal people. We brought him into ministry and sent him back to the same village that he was their chief doctor. He was, you know, when he was a chief doctor, he was powerful. But as a minister of the gospel, he was even more powerful. I can tell you, we have, we have records of transformation. We have records of men that were picked from the dung hill. And they grew to become a spectacle. When I, those days, we only had 32 pastors. Those days, we only had 32 pastors. And that, that was when? That was so long ago. Because in our last ordination, we ordained 42 pastors. Just one ordination, we ordained 42. So I'm saying when we had 32 pastors. So I called all the pastors from all the villages. They assembled in my house. I wanted to know if they, could, if they were prayerful. So I took them outside. I said, let's exercise ourselves. And we started speaking in tongues. I wanted to know who we fall down. That pastor was the strongest. He was the strongest. He was the strongest. He, the tongues he spoke was like machine gun. <laughs> to give beauty for ashes. I came to tell you that the ashes you've gathered for 20 years will become raw material for the Holy Ghost to build beauty out of your life in the name of Jesus Christ. So what people call your story is a lie when you come face to face with the Holy Ghost. Anything can happen. Just yield to Him. Oh my God. The oil of joy for morning. <laughs> the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called the trees of righteousness the plantings of the lord that he might be glorified can you take the hand of somebody close to you and begin to pray into that person's life <laughs>